This is London. Hello and welcome to Retrovision. Chris Purcell here, your host for the final episode of Vulcans, Victors and Cuba. And this is uh, exciting for me because this features some of the first footage I ever shot as a professional filmmaker uh, when I just left film school. The Vulcan at the time was about to be grounded. That was the news. I mean, as you all probably know, if you're watching this, it had a reprieve and went on flying and entertaining people right up until really recently. But it looked in the early 90s that it was curtains for the Vulcan. And that's what prompted me to try and film it, which uh, we, we managed to achieve. And I've got really strong memories of um, the first day of filming, sitting in the back of my brother's car in the boot as we drove along the taxiway with XH558, the, the last flying Vulcan, taxiing just behind us. Really close. You'd never be allowed to do it today. Plumes of spray and steam and jet fumes. It was incredible. How often do you see something like that in your rear view mirror? Thanks for watching. This was the code name given to the top secret World War III bunker, 250 feet below Corsham in Wiltshire. A special train would whisk ministers and military top brass away from Paddington Station on the Western Main Line. Just before Bath, the train would branch off into a tunnel that led straight to an underground station in the bunker. The location of Turnstile was ultra-sensitive. Only the War Cabinet's innermost circle knew of its existence, and there is no record of any Prime Minister ever visiting the facility. In fact, it is thought that the bunker remained a secret from Soviet intelligence until the late 70s. Attack warning red. A former quarry for Bath Stone, part of the 60-mile network of galleries and chambers, had been used in World War II as a cavernous ammunition depot an RAF operation centre and a sizeable factory for the production of Bristol aero engines. Some 210 ministers and support staff were earmarked to go underground at Turnstile during the lead-up to nuclear war. This quota allowed for key personnel only, with no provision for partners or children. The train would have entered the complex through a reinforced concrete opening. Once inside, the track divided into two before running on either side of an 800-foot platform. Next to this were decontamination units and shower facilities to wash off nuclear particles. After leaving this area, the party had a seven-minute walk along tunnels cut through the limestone to the operations centre. It is from here, with Soviet missiles only minutes away, that the Prime Minister would have ordered Alert Condition 1. This called for the annihilation of 30 to 40 Soviet cities, with an assumed casualty figure of at least 16 million. Big cities like Moscow and Leningrad would get two or three H-bombs each.
two under three. Come on. V-bombers climbed eastward at full power. Their crews would each have an all too vivid idea of what was about to happen to their families and ground staff on the bomber bases they'd left behind. V-bombers would be at 56,000 feet over the Baltic, approaching their start lines, the designated position and time for the start of the attack. It's important that all the attacks are coordinated. Um, you don't want to be going through somebody else's bomb blast, for instance. So they have to be coordinated. I think we'd have all been very frightened, that's for sure. But nevertheless, I'm sure we would have done it. From here, they would fly carefully pre-planned routes contrived to avoid Soviet defenses for the longest possible time. Predetermined positions over Soviet territory, radar jamming electronic countermeasures would be activated. The ECM was very advanced for the time. The previous year, V bombers had easily got through American defenses in a NATO training exercise. It worked by emitting radio interference or noise designed to jam Soviet radar. At that time, the Soviets placed great emphasis on controlling their fighter operations rigidly from the ground. Their pilots were instructed where to go, when to change height, and when to fire. So blacking out the ground radar stations was an effective defensive tactic. Soviet controllers would attempt to position a fighter no more than five miles behind the bomber, allowing the pilot to make visual contact. Four VHF channels were used to communicate with fighter aircraft. V-bombers were equipped with a jammer that transmitted a high-pitched screech on those frequencies. In spite of these defenses, some fighters would inevitably get through. The V-bomber crews then had to rely on maneuvers to try to avoid being shot down. The Vulcan in particular was very adept at this. In the very thin air at high altitude, its large wings were still extremely efficient, allowing it to outturn any attacking fighter. If air-to-air -air missiles were fired, the final resort would be to release bundles of tiny foil strips. This would confuse the fighter's radar guidance system. Those V-bombers that survived fighter interception would then enter missile-controlled sectors. With Blue Steel still not ready, the bombers were equipped only with three four Yellow Sun H-bombs and would have to fly all the way to their targets right through these SAM zones. Crews were briefed on the location of most surface-to-air missile sites, but there would have been too many to avoid them all. 
radar detection equipment on board the aircraft would indicate when radars were scanning in their direction. When these signals were detected, the air electronics officer would try to jam the missile radar and feed it false targets while the pilot conducted evasive maneuvers. <laughs> The main Soviet SAM missile needed 60 seconds of unjammed data to lock on. The V-bombers that successfully penetrated these defenses would now have split up to fly towards their respective targets. At 60 miles from weapons release, navigation and bombing computers would be updated by the radar operator, who would now be able to see the aiming point on his screen. When we got near our target, we'd start our bombing run on the specific heading. Uh, it would be a radar run. The bomb aimer would then take over on the autopilot, and we'd zip down all these blinds over every window in the aircraft. Uh, so that we wouldn't get blinded by the flash. Two miles short of the target, bomb doors would automatically open. The city directly below was about to befall the terrible fate experienced by London, Manchester and Glasgow a couple of hours before. In an instant, the temperature at ground zero would have risen to one million degrees centigrade. A crater of a mile wide and 150 feet deep would have been gouged out. Underneath the two mile wide fireball, all structures and anybody in them would have been vaporized. And buildings seven miles from the center of the burst would have been reduced to rubble by the blast wave. The bomber had just over one minute to get clear. The escape maneuver employed was aerobatic. Two slacker turn would be useless as all anti-blast measures required the aircraft to be tail on to the explosion. After this, crews were expected to try to get home. They were even given return routes that were every bit as detailed as the outbound legs. It was never planned to be a one-way mission. The object was always to get back to base if possible because we might have to be rearmed and might have to make a second strike. Had this unthinkable scenario ever become a reality, however, there would have been little or nothing for the bomber crews to return to. We were well aware of the effects that our weapons would have on the targets uh, and also the effect that the enemy's weapons would have back home. And, um, Certainly, we were fairly pessimistic about having anywhere to land when we came back, or even having a country to come back to. But uh, um, it, you get used to all sorts of things. Yeah. By lunchtime, Sunday the 29th of October, 1962, the world stepped back from the brink of a nuclear holocaust. Khrushchev promised that the missile bases in Cuba would be dismantled. In return, the Americans assured the Soviets that they would not invade the island. In a further deal, US medium-range missiles stationed in Turkey, only 150 miles from the Soviet border, were discreetly removed. With that, the most dangerous episode in the history of humankind had come to an end. I think that the V-Force really did help to keep the peace. I don't think anyone can deny that the deterrent worked. The tripwire philosophy um, where if Russia attacked, we would go all out. 
I think, was a big deterrent. At the time of the Cuban Missile Crisis, the RAF's Bomber Command had aircraft at the cutting edge of technology, operated by a highly trained elite fully capable of penetrating Soviet defenses. Britain's close proximity to the USSR meant these V-bombers would have been in the first retaliatory strikes on Russian targets. Fortunately for the world, Khrushchev backed down over Cuba at the 11th hour. Perhaps the presence of the V-force played some part in his decision.